So in this week's ethical readings, you're exploring the relationship between ethics and religion. So as you explore the relationship between religion and morality, you'll find that some people believe things are good because God commands them, and some things are bad because God forbids them. This is called divine command theory. So for example, if you argue that homosexuality, slavery, and genocide are wrong because God forbids them, then you're using divine command theory. But intelligent theists and atheists are aware that there is a deep problem with basing your morality on what God commands. And it's not simply that people disagree about God's existence or what God commands. There's a deeper problem. That is, even if everyone agreed that God exists and agreed on what God commands, this problem would remain. And this problem is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. A dilemma is when there's two choices and neither of the two choices is good. So what is the Euthyphro Dilemma? Well, Plato wrote a dialogue called the Euthyphro. Uh, and you'll be reading this dialogue and answering questions about it at the end of this lesson. In the dialogue, Socrates is talking to a religious man named Euthyphro. Now at one point, and this is the most important point in the dialogue, Socrates asked Euthyphro whether the gods love pious acts because they're pious, or if it's pious because it's loved by the gods. So the question can be phrased for the modern monotheist in the following way. Does God will it because it's good, or is it good because God wills it? This is a deep question, and I recommend that you think carefully about it before giving an answer. Now, Euthyphro could not adequately answer this question, and many theists have struggled with it ever since. So let's look at the two options of the dilemma. And as we proceed, I have three lovely pictures I drew to help you understand this dilemma. So let's start with the second option. The second option was, it is good because God wills it. And it has a few problems. Now, one obvious problem, again, is knowing God's will. People disagree about what God's will, which is one reason why there's so many religions. But this is a superficial problem. There's a deeper problem that exists even when we assume God exists and we agree on what God wills and commands. Now, before getting into these deeper problems, notice again that the second option is divine command theory, which is the position that God determines morality. That is, morally good acts are those that God commands, and morally bad acts are those that God forbids, right? So again, if you think homosexuality is wrong simply because God forbids it, then you're a divine command theorist, right? It doesn't matter if homosexuality is natural or unnatural or whether it promotes happiness. All that matters to the divine command theorist in the end is that God forbids it or allows it. So let's examine this problem with arguing that morality is nothing but what God commands, the problems with the second horn of the dilemma. Now the first problem with basing morality solely on what God commands is that it seems to make morality arbitrary. Okay? Since God could command anything to be good, and it would suddenly be good. For example, let's say divine command theory is correct, and it's wrong to drown kids for fun because God forbids it. Now, if the morally good act is simply what God commands, then God could change his mind tomorrow and command that I drown my kids in a bathtub, and that act would suddenly become good. It doesn't matter if I think killing children is usually wrong because it violates rights or doesn't promote happiness or simply goes against the empathy I have for kids. All of these reasons and moral emotions are irrelevant if I'm a divine command theorist in this case. So the first and major problem with the second option, it's good because God commands it, is it makes morality arbitrary. It makes morality like an arbitrary matter of taste. It's good simply because God likes it and God could like anything at any time. But again, I just don't see how God commanding and the drowning of kids for fun would suddenly make it good. I don't see how things are good because God commands or wills them. Now, a divine command theorist may object and say, well, God would never command you to torture, kill, or rape children for fun. But this response misses the point. If divine command theory is correct, then morality is simply based on what God commands. So how can anyone possibly know God would not command these heinous acts? To know that, the person would have to appeal to something other than God's command, right? And so they're not really a divine command theorist. Indeed, there was recently a lady in Houston who believed God told her to drown her kids in the bathtub. Also, God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. So some of the crusaders and many terrorists believe God commands them to do many heinous acts. So how do you know God won't ask you to kill your child tomorrow as he did Abraham? The bottom line is that divine command theory, the second option of the dilemma, makes morality arbitrary. Heinous acts like drowning children for fun would suddenly become obligatory if God commanded them. So at this point, it should... Also be clear that many people are not really divine command theorists. And this is because they present arguments like, God wouldn't do that because it's wrong to kill an innocent life. So their morality is really based on the idea that it's wrong to kill an innocent life, not so much what somebody claims to be God's will. Now, there are other problems with the second option. 
you know, it makes morality mysterious, it gives the wrong reasons for being moral, and I'll address those in the question section. For now, I'll simply say that not everyone understands the problem here with the second option. And this was the problem that Socrates outlined so long ago. But Euthyphro, atheist, and many intelligent theists do understand the problem. They understand that the second option implies that killing children for fun could be made moral. They understand that the main problem with the second option is that it makes morality arbitrary. And so they propose another option. They propose that an act is good not because God commands it, rather God commands it because it's good. And this avoids the arbitrary problem because it avoids the implication that killing children for fun could become morally good tomorrow. Now, however, the first option, God commands it because it's good, has one serious problem. It sets up a standard of goodness separate from God. So it makes God a middleman. This is a problem because most monotheists believe God is the omnipotent source of all goodness. If God merely recognizes good and then informs us humans, it follows that God is not omnipotent. God is not the source of all goodness, but merely informs us about some independent standard of good, like a middleman or a good parent. And you can see this illustrated in number one. So let's use an example. Imagine you have good parents and they train you to be go to bed at a reasonable time, to eat healthy, to follow the golden rule, to be empathetic towards others, and to live a good moral life. At some point, your reason, your intellect develops, and you understand that these things are not good because your parents commanded them. Rather, your parents taught you these things because they're good, perhaps because they help you flourish in life. So you realize that your parents and your culture are not the source of goodness. Rather, they are goodness recognizers. They are goodness transmitters. They teach you what they think will lead to a good life. Just as a mother acorn, you know, may teach a baby acorn to sunbathe and get enough water, right? So if you think something is good merely because your parents or culture say so, then you still have an immature or undeveloped mindset. Your parents and culture are good recognizers, not good creators. So if the first option is correct, then God is like a good parent. God is a good recognizer, not a good creator. If the first option is correct, there is a God-independent standard of goodness. And you can see this in the diagram. So John Arthur puts the point this way. If God approves kindness because it's a virtue and hates the Nazis because they were evil, then it seems that God discovers morality rather than inventing it. God's no longer sovereign over the entire universe, but rather is subject to moral law external to himself. So this turns God into something like a good parent or middleman who discovers principles that lead to human flourishing and then transmits them to us. To use philosophical jargon, God and your parents may originally be the epistemological source of your morality, that is, how you come to know good from bad, but they're not the metaphysical source. They're not what makes something good or bad. So now we have the two horns of the Euthyphro dilemma. Morality is either arbitrary, meaning anything can be good, or God is not the source of morality, and God is subject to an external moral law. So is there a solution? Well. Some people have presented a third option to the Euthyphro Dilemma, and this is the idea that God is goodness. God doesn't arbitrarily will what is good. Rather, goodness flows from God's essence. He is goodness. You can see this option in the diagram under number three. Now, to clarify number three, notice that we may use reason to discover God's essence, which is truth and goodness. For example, let's say Einstein's laws are true. When we rationally discover such laws, we are discovering the essence or the mind of God. Likewise, when we discover that slavery is bad, we are discovering the moral essence of God. And this is not essential to the third option, but it's a nice way to think of it. In short, God doesn't arbitrarily will goodness, as in picture one and two. Rather, God is goodness, so goodness flows inevitably from God's essence. However, <laughs> this third option may fall into the same dilemma. To see why, consider this question. Does God choose God's essence? Does God choose God's essence? Now, some people say God is omnipotent, and so he can choose his essence. If this is correct, then God could choose a different essence. But this presents the same dilemma that we found in Euthyphro. Did something else make God's essence, or did God choose his essence? If God chose his essence, then he chose that to be good. And if that is the case, he could have chosen a different essence, an, an essence that enjoys drowning kids, for example. If God did not choose his essence, then God is not omnipotent and is subject to something else that made his essence. So again, if God chose his essence, then he chose goodness, option two. The problem with this option is God could have chosen any essence. He could have chosen to like killing kids for fun. If God did not choose his essence, option one, then something independent of God chose it. 
In that case, God's essence and goodness are independent of God, and God becomes a good parent or middleman instead of the source of all goodness. So in short, the third option that I just explored seems to collapse into one of the first two options. So there you have it. This is the Euthyphro dilemma, the first two options. Socrates presented these first two options. He didn't address the third. So it's just as well since the third seems to collapse into the first two options. Now I agree with some other philosophers that your ability to deeply understand this dilemma is a reflection of whether you're capable of a certain kind of philosophy. Whatever you think, the Euthyphro is the portal into a much deeper exploration of the relationship between morality and religion. In the end, it challenges the idea that morality can base, be based solely on God's commands. It's a challenge to divine command theory. To deepen your understanding, please review the following questions and possible answers. Then follow the link to the actual Euthyphro dilemma and answer the guided questions. And again, don't neglect those primary sources, right? There's so much more there that I haven't covered in this video. So let's look at the questions real quick. Number one, explain how the second option, divine command theory, makes morality arbitrary. Well, killing kids for fun becomes automatically good if it's good or bad, simply because God wills it. There's no need to appeal to scientific facts, to empathy, to greatest happiness, to rights. The mere fact that God thinks and commands it to be good would make it so. So that's the answer to number one. Number two, discuss whether the second option, divine command theory, motivates a person to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Well, it seems to give the wrong reasons for being moral. So, for example, imagine a person chooses to not torture kittens because uh, he believes it causes unnecessary suffering. Now, a second person chooses to not torture kittens, but only because God forbids it. Now, isn't the first person more stable and moral? Okay, look at number three. Explain why the second option, divine command theory, makes morality mysterious. And this is from James Rachels in his Elements of Moral Philosophy. It makes it mysterious. Okay, so the problem here is the idea that an act is good because God wills it, um, it makes morality mysterious. We can understand how to make things, but how do you make things good? When we argue about moral matters like slavery, most people argue slavery is wrong because it violates rights, it doesn't promote the greatest happiness, or it doesn't follow the golden rule. But if divine command theory is correct, none of that really matters. All that matters is that God commands or forbids it. So morality is no longer a matter of determining how to protect rights or promote happiness, and now becomes a matter of knowing God's will. And it may be completely mysterious as to why God wills some things but not others. So like some forms of relativism, it just cuts off reasoning on moral issues. Okay, number four. Explain why the first option, God wills it because it's good, is unsatisfactory to modern the uh, monotheist. Well, it's unsatisfactory because it presents an independent standard of goodness uh, to God. It turns God into a good parent or middleman instead of the source of all goodness. Number five. Explain the three pictures representing the three options. Well, you can see that in the video. Number six. Explain or discuss the third option. Okay. Well, it seems to me that the third option, the idea that God is goodness and doesn't arbitrarily will good and bad, that this option faces the same problems if we assume God is omnipotent and could have chosen a different nature or essence for himself. If God is not omnipotent, then he did not choose his essence, and so there is an independent standard making God's essence, and hence is the true source of goodness. So this third option can become quite complex and distinctions like God's essence and existence need to be made, epistemology and metaphysics, but in the end I just think it collapses into the first two options. Number seven, can God be omnipotent if the third option is true? Well, yeah, but you know, um, God's omnipotence doesn't adequately resolve the Euthyphro dilemma because the question then becomes, did God get his essence, or did God choose his essence? That is, is God's essence good because it's good, or is God's essence good because God commanded and created his essence? <laughs> All right. Number eight, do people discover the mind of God when they discover what is right and wrong? Well, some people may think so, but this third option doesn't really resolve the Euthyphro dilemma, and you can see number seven for why. Okay. Um, let's see here, number nine, isn't this based on a misunderstanding of omnipotence? Well, no, I'm aware that omnipotence doesn't mean God can do the logically impossible, like round a square or create a married bachelor. However, the Euthyphro dilemma doesn't depend on omnipotence. It simply depends on whether an act is good because it's good or because God wills it. So to illustrate, we can substitute your culture for God. So do you believe it's good because it's good or because your culture wills it? The same issues arise without any claims to omnipotence. Okay, the next question. Is the Euthyphro Dilemma an argument against God's existence? Well, no. The Euthyphro Dilemma doesn't 
prove or disprove God's existence. Rather, it presents a challenge to anyone who bases morality in what they think God commands. Now, it is a counter to one of the arguments for God's existence, the moral argument, but it itself doesn't say God exists or doesn't exist. Um, another interesting question for the divine command theorist is why is it wrong to uh, disobey God? You know, it might be because God knows better than us, but if that's the case, God's like a good parent, not the source of all morality. He's the epistemological source, but not the metaphysical source, right? Um, maybe it's because of power, but then you would be following the principle that might makes right. Surely God doesn't want you to follow that principle, right? <laughs> okay, so let's look at the application of value here. So when you explore the Euthyphro dilemma, it can help you better understand the relationship at a deep level between, if you have them, your moral and religious beliefs. Now, all of the most intelligent and popular theists and atheists have struggled with this dilemma. Descartes, Luther, and um, Anselm, Hobbes, and so on. And now it's your turn, right? You're welcome. Now, in my experience, people often give simplistic answers at first. So, for example, they may argue that both horns of the dilemma, dilemma are true. But a little reflection should help you see why both options cannot be true. Second, some will try to avoid the dilemma by arguing there's a third option. You know, God is goodness. And this is more sophisticated. Many fine distinctions can be made between essence and existence, epistemology and metaphysics and so on. But in the end, this third option brings up the same dilemma. You know, was God's essence determined or was it chosen? And it's going to collapse into those first two options again. In the end, the divine command theorist ultimately resorts to arguments that make morality a really mysterious matter instead of one in which we try to maximize the greatest happiness and protect a set of rights that we agree on and that are essential for human flourishing. Now, there very well may be a God, but believing morality is nothing but God's commands is problematic. And even intelligent theists agree with me here. Intelligent theists believe that God gave them reason and empathy to discover right and wrong, to discover the conditions that best promote human flourishing. So, even, you know, and it's interesting that even the divine command theorists aren't usually divine command theorists because they often give God independent reasons for why we should obey God or act in moral ways. All right, so that's my take on the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, now you get to read the actual dialogue, and I included some questions for you here as you read. Enjoy. Thanks.